welcome you to another Facebook and YouTube Live. It's great to be with you. This is uh, Keith coming at you from uh, the Twin Cities here in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, where it's been unseasonably cold today. So if you've got anything above zero, you're warmer than Minnesota today. So I want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your schedule. We'll kind of have a really innovative chat talking with Dr. Christy Gleisman in just a few minutes about practical strategies that educators can do to set up students for success. And so if you're checking this chat out for the first time, you know, my passion is to strengthen and transform nursing education and really bring a context of practice in practice readiness and doing what we can to not only develop the clinical judgment, but the holistic clinical judgment of caring of critical thinking, of essential knowledge application, as well as the clinical reasoning that leads to the outcome of clinical judgment. So I just love to, you know, know who's out there tonight. So uh, share your names out there in the chat. Uh, let me know where you're coming from. I can see Kim from Illinois, uh, Nurse Carol from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Carol, I bet you it's warmer out in NC than it is here in MN and uh, Patsy from Georgia. And Patsy, I'll be coming down to Georgia at the uh, game conference here next month, actually about two weeks. So I hope to see you there. And um, thank you for joining me tonight. Um, but you know, as we look at, you know, some of the challenges that we're facing right now in nursing education, you know, we'll be talking about, you know, in essence, you know, we, we've got way too many nurses that are leaving the profession for a number of different reasons. And we need to retain, and not only just retain students, but really strengthen their success. And if you were with me two weeks ago, I come here every uh, every uh, other Thursday on uh, Thursday evenings here from my home office. And two weeks ago, we had a really engaging conversation with Deb Liebig and Christy Frisbee, who are colleagues of Nelda Godfrey and the work that Nelda is doing with professional identity formation in nursing. And really the importance of not only helping our students to, to think like a nurse, but also to care and to act like a nurse as well. And so we talked about that last week. And I just wanted to let you know that these conversations are not just random that you, if you can't make it, or if you really valued the conversation, you can join us. Um, the, the, the link lives on my YouTube channel, Think Like a Nurse. And this is the, 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 that can be subscribed to, so you can receive automatic updates. That link also, is last week's conversation and so if you found that if you found that helpful you would like to learn more please check that out and really kind of help our students to get a sense of their identity what it means to be kind of the few the proud the professional nurse and to really embrace kind of a new identity and what that looks like uh, with student success I also want you to know that I'm an admin uh, for a really uh, innovative group of educators on Facebook. Now, I'm not a huge Facebook fan, but uh, there's an educator group out there. It's a closed group that just has grown to over 10,000 educators from around the world. It's called Teachers Transforming nursing education. If you're not a part of that, it's just a supportive community of educators who share their stuff. You can ask any question and get supported and really kind of network and collaborate and just celebrate each other's successes as well as learn from each other and share things. And so I just want you to know that that resource is available to any of you um, if you're not currently in that, uh, um, in that group. You know, as we look at today's topic, um, you know, we need to kind of recognize that we are in crisis right now as a profession and really have a perfect storm going on right now. I just came across an article called the 2021 American Nursing Shortage. It's just kind of a, a very powerful blog that talks about the American nursing shortage. You know, we're talking about, you know, we've always kind of thought the shortage, you know, we know it's always been here, but internationally it's been there. But in this country with the pandemic, you know, we have almost over 500,000 nurses who have left the profession since the COVID pandemic began by the end of 2022 is what's forecasted, a shortage of 1.2 million uh, nursing positions that are forecasted. And in addition to that, we have 80,000 
educators that we're short on. And so we are not able to teach and to train and to, and to get out into the practice setting uh, countless tens of thousands of nurses because of the shortage. And so we can't fix all of these things, but there is something that we can fix as educators, or at least we can own kind of what we can do to influence. It's kind of like the serenity prayer. There are things out there that are beyond our control. And that's the pandemic, the consequences, a lot of things in our academic institutions. But there is something we all can control. And that's basically not only how we teach, but how we can strengthen and support our students. And really, you know, so, you know, there are some students that are rock stars and there are some that need that support. They're first generation college students. They're gonna need not necessarily their handheld, but they're going to need kind of some additional services and support and they can make it, but we've gotta be willing to put that extra effort in and put that work in. And that's kind of where I came across Dr. Christy Glessman. And when I was gonna rewrite uh, my student textbook, Think Like a Nurse, into a completely new rewrite for my third edition, I knew that I needed to have something special with the content because I'm not a student success expert. You know, we, you can't do it all and I'm not that and I will never propose to be, but uh, our paths crossed and Christy's doing some really innovative work uh, at her College of St. Mary in Nebraska. And so I'm gonna introduce Dr. Christy Glessman. She's joining us tonight. And uh, Christy, why don't we just let them see uh, who you are and uh, Dr. Okay. Christy Glessman is the Director of Undergraduate Nursing and Associate Professor of Nursing at College of St. Mary in Omaha, Nebraska. Her career centers around guiding and empowering success for pre-nursing and BSN students, as well as coaching faculty to do the same. She's working on implementing a project bold at the college, which aims to improve access to nursing education, strengthen academic support services, and empower women to mitigate barriers for their careers in nursing and to positively impact the workforce. With her colleague, Dr. Mindabarna, at the same college, she's the co-author on the chapters in the upcoming Think Like a Nurse uh, textbook series. This is volume one, laying the foundation for professional practice. Her chapters were co-authored on laying the found on don't just survive and thrive and academic success strategies for optimum academic results in the upcoming textbook series so most importantly though christy is married and the mother of five children well done that's a lot of work we had five children as well and i know that is not an easy road and you're also doing all that you're doing in academia christy so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here tonight and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. You know, so Christy, just kind of, you know, tell us about your journey. As you know, as you look back, you know, all of us have a story, a journey as far as what interested us in nursing and then nursing education and then student success. So it's kind of like a, you know, a, a, a progression. Uh, share that journey because there's usually a reason why we kind of are on the path that we're on. So what's your journey? You know, I had always, even growing up, wanted to be in a service-oriented, helping-oriented profession. And as I approached high school and was really looking at colleges, healthcare just struck me um, as more of an interest point over and over again. And so initially, I actually went to school to do physical therapy. And it was through my work um, as a physical therapy tech that I was like, I'm actually not sure that this is the avenue I want to go with, I want more patient care. I want more hands-on. And so that's when I made the transition over to nursing. Um, my time in teaching actually got started right away. And it was because I had the opportunity on the floor pretty quick um, to start precepting students and to start orienting new um, nurses on the floor. And I found that I really, really enjoyed the relationship that you can build there and the sharing and the collaboration that can go. Um, and I had a wonderful mentor and role model while I was in school who must have seen something in me because she persuaded me right away to come back for my master's. So it was one continuous kind of ebb and flow between bedside nursing, 
coming in as a clinical adjunct. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm ready to make the transition to full-time academics. And I think once I was at CSM as an educator and saw the other side of it, that's when I started really understanding um, we needed to do more. We needed to take one step further. Um, and we needed to see how we could partner with that student to help them reach their ideal of success. And what does that look like to them and how are they going to achieve it? Everybody's going to be on a different pathway, just like we were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how long were you in practice before you entered academia? And what was that transition to academia like? You know, when you look at a lot of new educators, you know, who are also typically, you know, who are out there because we're having a lot of turnover and a lot of new faculty. Um, so just briefly touch upon that and just anything that you found helpful in that transition. But uh, what did that look like? So um, my experience on the floor, solely on the floor, was only a few years before I started adjuncting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of did both. You know, I, I did the adjunct role for a while while I was still full time on the floor. And then I started inching over more towards academics and pulling back a little bit from the floor. But in all, I still had about seven years of overlap because they I didn't want to get away from the bedside, but I still loved teaching. And it was really hard for me to decide until life got busy enough. It forced mm -hmm. me to decide. Um, so it was really that point of being able to see um how you can collaborate with them and how you can learn just as much from the student or that new nurse on the floor and that part was just super exciting and you know even when i was younger i always said yes i wanted to be a service yes i wanted to be helping but the other piece that i always had gone back to was but what if i want to be a teacher and this i got to combine both so it was the best of both worlds i still Still got the nursing piece, but I got the teaching as well. Okay. And so in that kind of student success role, what are some of the things that you saw? You know, where are students struggling? Kind of like, where did you struggle? And did you see those same themes repeated when you began to transition into your academic role? Okay. I think what I saw is that, you know, when I first started, I had one idea of how I thought it should go. And the pathway in which I thought students should learn. And it was this, this almost linear path, right? And as I worked through challenges with other students and I saw the effort that they were putting in and I saw the potential that was there, but for whatever reason, we kept hitting that roadblock and, and we couldn't get them past it or we did, but it was so hard. I thought there, ha like, there has to be a better way or a different way to go about this. Um, and, and maybe we need to approach this just like we would approach nursing. If a patient comes to you, what do we do? We meet them where they're at. And we say, where are you at currently? And where do you want to get to? And that's the approach that we need to use with students. It is no different. The this, this same nursing process, the same patient education process that, that we talk about is the same process that can work with our students. Because we meet them where they're at, we determine what their idea of success is, and then we counsel them along the way. And that might mean that we have to try a few different strategies and it doesn't always work the first time and sometimes it's messy, but understanding that it's not always perfect and it's not always the cleanest cycle, that's okay. We revise our patient plans, right? Mm -hmm. We'll revise our plans with our students. And, you know, I want to open this up to kind of make this a three-way conversation with our audience. You know, you're all here live. And, you know, if you've got questions as you're looking at the challenges that you face with students today, uh, supporting them and that tension between, you know, that that balance between support, enabling, um, you know, and, and giving them too much, you know, what does that look like? It's kind of like sometimes being a parent and those boundaries can sometimes, you know, you have such a heart to serve, but I know that we all have questions out there. So, you know, I want you to basically, I'll, we'll keep our eyes open on the chat. So I just want you to feel free to just kind of interject. And as we have this conversation, we'll definitely get to your questions, which is why you're here. So please, uh, you know, go ahead and do so. Um, I want to touch upon Christy, you know, just what are the most common if you look at the themes, you know, what are the themes 
that students, you know, are, you know, if we were just to kind of look at what are we seeing most often, what are you seeing most often with your students in the Midwest, you know, a traditional BSN program, um, you know, what is it that you're seeing out there as the most common themes where students are struggling and there's things that we as faculty can do, because let's be honest, when it comes to student success, it is a partnership. There's only so much that we can do as educators and there's, things that students have to do their part, but what are those themes that at least that educators can have an impact on that we can make a difference? Mm -hmm. What are those? I think, you know, part of what I hear, and sometimes I still get caught up with it with, of students today have changed, or we've seen a rapid change from um, the action oriented student that we think that we should have in the classroom from where we were five years ago or 10 years ago. But high school has changed, junior high has changed. And actually, as my kids get older and get into those, that's where I'm like, now it's starting to click a little bit more. I'm starting to see why I'm having the challenges in the classroom that I'm having, because I see the preparation that they're having at those other levels. And it's not to say that it's wrong, but it's different. I didn't grow up in a time where everything was digital. Everything was right there. So in a, in a student who has had that digital world at their fingertips, who's had an LMS that has a calendar built right in and the faculty or the teachers in, you know, K through 12, they, they enter their assignments and it's all there to ask them or tell them that the first step is to make sure that you're using your planner, that is not a natural concept to them. I grew up with a planner. So it's it's recognizing that it's not wrong or um, I wouldn't even say underprepared, differently prepared. So if we want to meet them where they're at, how can we either utilize that technology and adapt it to what we believe um, will work best for them um, in that collaborative nature? Or is it getting it out, old school pen and paper, and drawing it out so that we can see, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I want you to do. And if that means that I got to spend 30, 45 minutes trying to build a schedule with a student, that 30 or 45 minutes that I spend in that first couple weeks of class, hopefully it's the first couple weeks of class, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's going to pay off in the end. So it's not a decrease in expectations. They still have to meet what we say, you know, grade wise, clinical wise, skill wise. But we are supporting them in a way that will allow them to earn their independence or gain more independence as they go along. We just got to equip them with the tools that they haven't been equipped with yet. So it almost sounds like, you know, Christy, we need to demonstrate a, a measure of empathy and understanding at, to our students that we as nurses are called to demonstrate to our patients. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think if we can do that in the classroom, if we can do that during office hours, however that looks, via email, virtual meetings, however that student needs to get their needs met. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we can role model that and they can see how impactful that was to them, I believe they are more likely to do the same in return. Mm -hmm. So, but we have to show them that. And if we are more supportive, instead of saying, you know, figure it out, these are the expectations and kind of leaving them, I feel like that's where some of that, um, maybe animosity or friction between students and faculty or new nurses and old nurses or experienced nurses, that's where that can sometimes, I think, start to begin. And we can change that landscape when they enter a nursing program. Mm -hmm. Well, you also kind of say, you know, Christy, that there's a really, uh, an, that kind of a, what aligns to that is kind of the importance of building in your classrooms, in your program, kind of a culture of community, a connectedness, that there's a culture that we're building that is supportive, that you belong here. We're all different, you know, thank mm -hmm. the Lord, we're all different. We don't have to all think and look alike, but we, we you belong here and you can kind of, there's a supportive yes. belonging community 
Um, do you feel that that's a goal that we also need to really make a priority within our cultures of academia, in our classrooms and everywhere else? Absolutely. And if we can, and I think we're seeing some of that as we say we need to integrate more active learning into the classroom and mm -hmm. we're trying to do these things in groups and, and pairs. So I th think we're doing the things that will help foster some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but the more that we can do it with them, the more that we can role model that, um, the more that they see that collaboration even amongst faculty or the faculty, clinical faculty with the staff nurses, the more we can display what we want to see them do, yes. I think the more successful we're going to have, uh, the more success we will have in seeing that later on when they reach the profession. No, I totally agree, Christine. Even for myself, I've always kind of wondered when I was new to academia and saw the levels of incivility and the culture of the, uh, of just the back rooms of academia, and we all know what that looks like. You know, the the the, the incivility that is perpetuated in the profession. Where do students? Get us where is that role modeled? And unfortunately, sometimes we can role model for for good. We can also role model some of the classic, you know, un, un disrespectful behaviors of incivility. So they're really we, you know, we got to start at ground zero, which is we got to live it out. We got to okay. role model that. So I love that emphasis. Um, we got some great questions, uh, Christy. Let's get this in the let's, let's start from the first one here. Uh, Lisa asks, how do you handle support faculty? that is more from the traditional role of nursing school, they either get it or they don't. And they're okay with the student not being successful. That's a really good, I'd love you to grab that. That's a great question. You, you grab that. That's a yeah. great uh, opening. So let's talk about that. So Lisa, I guess my question would be is why, right? Just like when we ask the students in the classroom to really get down to the foundation of it, why are we seeing that? And what is the belief in that? Is that because that's what they were needing to do? Uh, you know, that's what was modeled for them. And can, or is it because there's that belief that if we're doing this, we are lowering the expectations, we're lowering the bar. And I think there's a way to have that conversation to say, we're not lowering the bar. We're just changing how we get to the bar. And it's not wrong to help them while still keeping those expectations. So if my expectation is no late work or a certain percentage on an exam, that's still the expectation. I'm not changing that. But when they're struggling or when I see something that might kind of tip me off that maybe the student is going to struggle or might be at risk or might be hitting some motivational challenges, what can I do more proactively instead of reactively? If, you know, we talk about the staffing challenges, we talk about the challenges that we have because we don't have enough faculty or clinical space. And so we can't increase the enrollment. But we have the opportunity to increase our graduation rates, because if we are losing 20% of our students or 30% of our students, that is 20 to 30% more that we could be graduating if we can support them in doing that. And that support, that foundational building on those academic success toolkit, essentially, and learning what that is for that student will set them up later. So it might mean that they need a little bit more support at the beginning. It might mean that they need a little bit more reminding at the beginning or um, tips and tricks and trial and error on what process works. But towards the end, towards the middle, somewhere in there, they should become more independent. And if they're starting to feel like they're a little reliant on us, then we can start spacing that out. We're not going to meet this week. Let's meet next week. I want you to come with this already done so that then we can review it and really start pushing that just like we would with children. You know, you said it earlier. Um, it, it's it's very similar, very similar. And it's the same way that we would approach patient care. If, if we have a patient who's non-compliant on something, why? We have to get down the, the why and then we have to work within their restrictions 
because we're not necessarily going to change the environment in which they're coming from, but we can change how they may react to that environment or work within that environment that will allow them to be more successful. No, excellent points, Christy, and uh, thank you for sharing. And you have another, uh, Tammy Lynn just kind of commented, I think that these issues that you're talking about were exacerbated by remote learning, Zoom and the pandemic. Well, you know, I, I'd like you to kind of compare and contrast, Christy, with kind of the student struggles before the pandemic and then what you're seeing currently. And are they similar? Are they different? Are they worse? You know, uh, Tammy Lynn saying, I think they gotten worse. And I'd just like to know, what are you seeing in what aspects are students struggling with their success because of the uh, because of uh, remote learning and some of the challenges it represents? I think you know in, in education in nursing education we've talked about how we need to get more involved. We need to take it out from the lecture or the more passive learning environment, and we need to move it to an active learning environment. And not all students love that response right away. Right, we got to eventually coach them to get to love that or at least appreciate that model. Um, but for some, when you're learning remote and if it's a recorded lecture or a recorded exercise, that is more passive. And for some, that is a lot harder to stay engaged. And so we have potentially inadvertently set up some really bad habits that are not setting them up for success. And now we're bringing them back into the classroom and we're expecting them to just go away. But we we have to kind of like retrain our brain. When we get into unhealthy habits and we kind of get into that slump, they can do that same thing. And we have to just recognize that what does it take for us to get out of that? And how can we apply that to this situation? Got some other, got a lot of questions in the chat here, Chris. I'm trying to keep track of all. I'm just going <laughs> to do a one-two punch because they're similar. Okay. Uh, Patsy is talking about how just some of the, 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 the students aren't coming in with like able to make decisions, poor decision making. They're creating their own struggles. Then she adds this. I see students struggle in following instructions. Simple two-step instructions are difficult to follow and successfully complete. And then Tammy Lynn adds another comment. So many have no idea to, how to study or even what it means to take, oh, here, let me pop that out, uh, know how to study or what it means to take notes. Now, these are simple skills. Mm -hmm. Now, how to get a student to follow instructions, maybe that's, I don't know how difficult that, that might be a little more challenging. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, Christy, we can make a difference. And do we provide some of these practical strategies? Because students in high school, it's very passive pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And here we are, active learning and all these, you know, it's a whole different, it's a wild west from their perspective mm -hmm. in learning. And they're just really stressed by that. So how can we, I think, you know, when I, when I look at this question by Tammy Lynn, and you can comment on Patsy's with some of these other aspects of instruction following, uh, how can we, you know, what are some things that you have done to really set your students up for success by teaching and providing some framework to teach these skills? Uh, you know, Keith, I think that leads into directly what Dr. Barna and I wrote about in chapters two and three. Yeah, and it is really walking the student step by step through what they need to do. So, you know, if we log into Google and we, we say like successful strategies in nursing, we're going to see things like create your schedule and do this. But it, it's not wrong because that is what we need to do. But if they have not been taught how to do that, we got to get down to the how. Yeah. So just like in the classroom and in clinical, we're constantly asking what or why, now what, what happens next. Mm -hmm. Instead, now we have to say how. How are you currently going about it? What is working with that? What isn't working with that? And let me tell you why I see that this may be a challenge later on for you or in the near future. Yeah. And so again, it's it's activating that like that nursing process and that patient education piece. Where are they at, and what do they what do they feel comfortable and confident in, and what don't they? And sometimes it means asking them to get out their notes and see it. Yeah. Sometimes it means 
paying attention or when you're walking around and you see something happening that you make a mental note of that so that the next time that you can talk to them, you can say, this is going to be a teaching moment. Let's talk about the process in which you're utilizing for this, Mm -hmm. but walk them through that step by step and not just talk about what we need to do in a broad sense, but a very real how to do it. Um, When we teach nursing process, right? We walk them through step by step. We have to do that with the student study strategies because if they are not equipped to do that, we are setting them up for challenges unnecessarily and they really need that foundational learning. So if they don't figure it out early on, but they get by, okay, but later on, they're going to have those knowledge gaps. And when they try to build on that, that is going to be a struggle. So if we can fix it or help them um, learn those techniques themselves, Mm -hmm. then they're more likely to be successful later on. And we should see less attrition and Mm -hmm. we should see less struggles. And, you know, in chapter three, you know, Christy, you and Mindy, you know, wrote extensively about strategies for academic success. And that's the SOAR acronym. But, you know, you brought it, you made it so practical. You talked about handwrite your class notes. Talk about some of these practical things that we can we can we can really help our students to to read with a purpose. You had some great uh, a section of some practical strategies on how to read a textbook to learn and to yes. and, and, and to understand it. And so some of those, if you uh, can recall, I just love you to just kind of break down some of these really practical strategies that our students need to know. So one opportunity that we've had um, over the last year and a half or so is that we've started this strategies for success course. And I think I've grown uh, leaps and bounds since then because I've recognized just how much I cannot assume, even though I thought I was already doing a good job of that or at least an okay job of that. I recognize my own limitations right away. Um And so walking them through and supporting them through some of those self-assessments and some of those self-reflections and step-by-step walking them through, okay, what is working and what's not? What are you doing? I want you to tell me step-by-step, what are you doing at this stage of the learning process versus this? So if I get a student in, in my office, even if it's not a course that I teach, I can still tutor them, so to speak, because I, I'm not actually tutoring the content. So many times it's not actually a content issue. It is how they're engaging with the content. So I will start with those basic questions. What do you do before class? What do you do before class to engage or get prepared? I've had some students tell me they literally do nothing, which I applaud them. Show up for being honest with me, because I will tell them from the beginning, if you tell me that you do something that you're not really doing, the plan that we create is not going to work. Um, And I will have some students who are so black and white, they will say, I have math class before I come here. I meant with the content for this class, right? And so like reframing some of those questions, what You know what we're walking into class to do today. Have you opened your book? Have you opened the syllabus? Do you have any idea what content topic we are covering? Okay, now let's take it from, have you at least done a basic review? Is it overwhelming for you to read the textbook because you haven't been asked to or you haven't needed to, you've been able to get away with it without having to read the textbook before? All right, let's break it down. What can we do? Can we resource them out to something like nursing made incredibly easy that gives them a really high level with a lot of detailed pictures that they can skim real quick before class. That's okay. They at least got into the content, right? And now they can apply a little bit of what we're going through and it's not brand new information. Um, Or is it that they really have a hard time staying focused in the textbook when they're reading I've had a lot of success having students buy the audio version while having the hard copy and listening to that while they're following along in the text. Between the two on the visual and the auditory, it is making more connections and they've just had success that way. Um, And then what are you doing in class? How are you taking notes? Are you typing them? Are you handwriting them? What does it look like? 
Um, but I had a student tell me that they couldn't keep up. This faculty member was talking too fast and there's no way they, they are so lost in that class. And I thought, never heard that about that faculty member. And so I like took a step back and I was like, can you show me what you're doing? And she pulled out her notebook. She has pages of notes. Okay. You're taking them all on the notebook. Where are you getting lost at? Where are you falling behind at? Well, she hadn't been printing her PowerPoints, but the slide deck was there. She didn't know how. As soon as I showed her how to do that and she can just add to them, now we're in a different position, right? Yeah. She hadn't been asked to do that before because everything had been on the iPad. So, you know, breaking it down to see where the challenges are, we only had to have that conversation once. Mm -hmm. And so now that we're recognizing, you know, okay, we can't, we can't assume that they know to print that slide deck. We got to go here. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, understand and breaking it down that there's a difference on what you do immediately after class when you are finishing up and compiling that single comprehensive set of notes and you're filling in some of the gaps that you miss and reviewing the text and studying for an exam. Because when you get to that studying part, when you get to the engaging part, you're no longer just reviewing and trying to soak it in. Now you're trying to integrate it with things that you've learned before and you're trying to take it to that next level. And you're asking, or we should be asking ourselves, those clinical judgment type questions that you have posed, you know, again, to the class, can they pose them to themselves and take that to the next level? But for a lot of students, Studying for that exam just means quickly skimming their notes or re-listening to a lecture or whatever that is. And so we have to tell them that that is two separate pieces of the learning process. And we have to spell out what that looks like. Excellent. You know, Patsy's got a question. We've got a lot of questions here. We're gonna just uh, go to get as many as we can. It says, we are partners with our students in this journey. When the student doesn't do well, then we need to address and help them do better. But the student must meet and work with the educator, which is rough for some students. They shut down or get very defensive, Christy. I don't know if your students do that, but I know that mine uh, here in Minnesota, it's like some of them just have a very like, they can't receive it. And there's a lot of stuff beneath the waterline. It's not always like, oh, they're a bad student. It's like, they may have had some upbringing issues and some things where they were always criticized. And we got to understand that there's usually a why that mm -hmm. some of the behaviors we see. But what are your thoughts about that? You know, with some of these, you know, you know, when, you know, how do you basically get a student to kind of when they are, you know, they, they don't either receive the feedback, get defensive, critical. And how can we partner with them to kind of get to know our students, I think is really the key to have that a relationship to understand them. But I'd love to your feedback on how do we navigate those rough waters sometimes with those kinds of dynamics? I think it it's making sure that number one, we're approachable with okay. the student. Number two, I would say that it's asking the questions in a, a really non-defensive non or non-accusatory way as much as possible. I'm not saying that I've had success with every student. There are some students that challenge me and push back as well. Um, but it is asking those why questions. It is talking about, okay, what's working well? You, you don't like this class. What? Why don't you like this class? You don't like this faculty member. Why don't you like this faculty member? Well, they're doing something and they, they don't like that teaching method. That doesn't mean it's wrong. Let's talk this through. You know, everybody learns a little bit different. If this is what is being done in the classroom and it is not fitting in with your learning style, then what can we do on your aspect outside of the classroom so that we can adapt or um, grow into appreciating this learning style so that you can engage with it more and be more successful? You know, and Dana's got a great question I want to bring up. Um, she says, how do you develop students to be self-directed learners? And even maybe kind of that dynamic of how do we motivate students to give them a thirst for the knowledge of nursing and what they're learning and, and not just to see it as just a checkbox to pass a test, but to give them a, a, a real, the right, a motivation, Christy, that, that they're inwardly motivated 
um, to learn, I think is the essence of what Dana is asking here. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And what can educators do? We can't make them drink like the horse, proverbial horse, but we can lead them. How right. do we lead our students? I think some of this is, um, you know, like we've talked to Keith about performing some student self-assessments. Where are they? Are they more of a growth mindset, a fixed mindset? Where can we, where can we turn that um, around at? If they're not motivated to do it, why? Is it because they don't like that learning plan? Not the content, but like how we've suggested to do it. Does it not work for them? For some students, if I tell them to do concept mapping, they're done because that is overwhelming to them when they look at that paper. But we can do concept mapping to achieve that same thing in a different format. We can put it into a table format if you need to. And so it might be looking at that student to say, why doesn't this work for you? What successes have you had in the past and how can we apply it to what we need to do now? Uh, but I also think it starts with making sure that while we say, yes, this is the minimum standard for this class, what is our bigger picture? Our bigger picture is not the test. It's not passing the class. It's not even passing NCLEX, though for a program that's very important, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the bigger picture, the bigger why is you went into nursing to help. You went into nursing for positive patient outcomes. How are we going to get to positive patient outcomes if you don't understand this material, if you cannot apply this material? And these general concepts can be applied in many different aspects of nursing. So even if you don't think that you're going to be a med surge nurse and you really want pediatrics, okay, let's talk about how this concept can apply to pediatrics. And let's talk about how we can motivate you and, and turn that thinking into, instead of, I'm not interested in this, how we can at least appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We don't all have to be the ED nurse or the L&D nurse. We don't have to love it, but we have to appreciate and respect mm -hmm. that area yeah. while we excel in our own. Thanks for sharing. I've got another question here from Laura, kind of towards the end here. It says, I have advisees who spent their last two years um, a high school remote. They're used to getting A's. Then college hits them like a ton of bricks. Then the nursing major comes. How to convince them to use their resources, even as simple as talking to their instructors. And I think as well as the expectation of get, I'm getting A's and now I'm getting B's and C's. You know. How do you navigate that um, with students and getting them to kind of, you know, it's like we almost have to, there's like an enculturation that we need to, you know, that this is not high school, this is not 13th grade, and it's very different. And I think that sometimes we minimize that difficulty and that real transition that our students have. Um, but what are your thoughts on those uh, points that Laura brings out? Um, I would say, Again, it, it's an approachability factor, and we know that there are going to be students who are not necessarily going to willingly come up to us, but can we seek them out during a break time? Can we message them and say, I've noticed this? Um, one area of um, method of success that we have seen that's a little bit more proactive, and I understand, depending upon course size, this does not always work, but we have been able to do more of a proactive approach in our strategies for success course. And every student meets with us a minimum of three times by about two thirds of the way through the semester with that first approach being within the first seven to 10 days. What does that look like? Where are you at? What are your long-term goals? What is your goal for the end of this semester? What challenges are you anticipating um, where have you seen successes versus challenges before and trying to be very proactive? It, it can be very repetitive. And sometimes I feel like I've said the same thing 15 times, but maybe the 16th time it will finally click. Like I really do have to do this. This, this is not working. Um, and sometimes they're, sometimes they're not going to be successful and we cannot change that. And they still have to meet expectation. And in that point we can, support them through that process of being unsuccessful. And now what are our next steps? Is it still recoverable? Okay, what did we learn from this experience? Things are not always gonna go well. Let's hit the reset button and let's move forward. 
You know, and in closing, Christy, this has gone way too quickly. And, uh, you know, I want to respect the time of our educators and those that are attending. But I want to give you I want to give a shout out to the work that you're doing with Project Bold, B-O-L-D, and what you're doing specifically at the College of St. Mary to improve access to nursing education and those support services. Just in principle, just I know that you're pro you know, what you're doing is unique. But what are some of the bigger principles that of what you're doing that we as educators can learn from this is where we can learn from each other and that's why i love having guests such as yourself because you know we can all just really um we, we we're all enriched in the process so i just love you to share just uh, in closing some of those thoughts and what is it that you're doing um mm -hmm. and what are you seeing and what can we learn from that project bold was born out of the questions that we were asking ourselves of why are students not as successful as we would like to see them? Where are the most common challenges? What are we seeing? How can we make a difference in the profession and in the workforce? So, and I know various states are um, at different levels, but I know that in Nebraska, the nursing workforce and the diversity of that workforce does not match our population at all, not even close but who are we admitting into our programs and how are we going about that recruitment cycle and how are we demonstrating to students who may be first generation students um, that you can be successful in college. You need to be able to see yourself being successful and success does not just mean straight A's. Success means something different to everybody and it is not just academics, it's professionally, it's personally, and how can we support them on that journey in a more proactive approach? Let's stop the cycle of failure before it even starts. It's much easier to prevent it than it is to fix it once it's started, right? So what can we do with that student to say, okay, these are some of the things that I'm seeing um, from maybe your transcript or Talk to me about where some of your challenges have been before. Let's talk about what some of the resources are for success and go one step further instead of just saying, okay, I would recommend that you go do this. Say, I want you to go meet with so-and-so. I want you to talk about this and then you're going to come back next Monday and we're going to meet again and you're going to show me what you guys got accomplished so that I can see it and we can work, talk about how that applies then to um, your nursing class specifically. So, you know, I understand that sometimes student support services aren't always nursing focused, but the foundation is still there. And so we can still utilize and collaborate with other services and we don't have to do it all on our own to say, right. focus with this student, work with this student on this piece, and then I'll pick it back up and apply the, the nursing piece of it. And so we can do that in a stepwise approach. And if we do it in a manner that is supportive, um, not condescending if they if they really do feel supported um in that they're going to come back mm -hmm. can we save everybody we're not going to save everybody yeah. it won't happen right yeah. but do i think that through more proactive strategies and through more supportive strategies we can hold the bar and still get more um, students graduated and successful and into the profession yes if we can increase diversity, if we can increase the leadership, if we can increase some of the patient advocacy, all of those pieces in there, what are they going to be able to accomplish in the nursing profession? Yeah. And that impact that we had with them on how we made them feel, or we were that cheerleader that they never had before, that will mean something, just like it means the to the patient sitting there who doesn't have family coming up and you are there for them at the bedside, we can be there for them at the bedside in the classroom. Yeah, no, oh, that's beautiful. Thanks, Christy. Um, you know, you were kind enough to share some links with us that I'm gonna basically throw the chat, three links and you can see them there. And this is all for you to download guys. So it's like, these are links you can just simply uh, download from the chat, but explain each of these really briefly, Christy, and why they're valuable and why educators need to check these out. So I'm really looking at when I'm working with students to have them do a self-assessment and to make sure that it is not a one-size-fits-all approach and to break that down into the pieces of the learning cycle so that they can see how 
what I might expect and how they can adapt it to their own learning preferences. Um, and so it's really just looking at how we can create a map of success, just like we would with uh, our patient care plan. Now we're going to do it with a student. Um, but the student doesn't always come up with all of those ideas on their own. And so by doing this and providing templates for them to work through and for us to work through those templates with them and explain what each of those things are or how to interpret results of an online assessment about growth mindset or about learning styles, that is going to be more meaningful because otherwise they don't know how to that's great if they know what type of learner they are, but now they don't know what to do with that and how that could in positively impact um, their educational journey and even their professional journey after that with, you know, continuing education and whatnot. So let's work with them to create that model. And it doesn't have to be super time intense because these can be small things that we do in the first five, 10 minutes of class or that you offer a group tutor study strategies over lunch or, you know, shortly before class, come 15 minutes before. And if you need help, if you're challenged with this, we'll do it as a group. And then it's not quite as scary as meeting with a instructor one-on-one, -on -one, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we can look at different ways to do it. We're not going to get to everybody and some students are going to challenge us more, but I would just say you started in nursing to with the desire to help others and to make a positive impact on their quality of life. Let's look at that. How can you implement that same calling into education? How can you more holistically support that student in their journey to be a professional nurse? And how do you want them, how do you want to shape them so that they can shape the landscape of nursing? Yeah, no, that's, you know, it's kind of like just taking what we do as nurses and how we, we can't lose our identity as a nurse and how we care for patients. That's what I really take away, Christy, from your heart is that that importance of just transferring that and not to, you know, be the nurse ratchet of educators, you know, and think that that's a good thing, you know, or that we're all have high standards. It's like, no, you still maintain that caring, but you have, I, but what I see, what I really value with your perspective is that you, you don't compromise standards. And that's something that I think sometimes there's a tension between retention and success. That's kind of another conversation, but you know, retention at what cost? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to maintain the standards. And I think that what I love about what you've shared tonight is that we can do both. We can support, we can guide, we can mentor, we can role model, um, but we can also have a standard and says, you didn't make it. You know, we're not going to lower it or give you a little, oh, we'll kind of just give you a point. You know, we're going to just basically say, what can we learn and have you come back? And I know from my experience, when students aren't successful the first time, barely you know they come back the second time if they're motivated and they okay. nail it they they hit it out of the park and it's just beautiful to see so it doesn't have to necessarily be failure okay. and so i'm going to just want to close with one uh you shared three tools um christy i don't know if you all know but she shared numerous tools in the chapter excuse me that she wrote um in chapter three let me get a little drink here i don't know why i'm getting froggy yeah i haven't done any talking <laughs> <clears throat> But um, she shared, uh, she's got a bundle that she created and that she's also uh, sharing with uh, this audience that, and I made a, a, a file here, but what I want to share, Christy, is that I want to share one of them because I think it's, it's really a very practical one and I'm going to pull it up here. So let me just, I just want to just show educators here real quickly here um, what you have here and let's just, uh, whoops, let me just, uh, did I, uh, let me, uh, let me reshare the window here. There we go. And what I want to just share here, I'll see how we can, uh, if we can see this, I'll just kind of make it bigger. But it's a course map for success, a course success map. And there's just, I just want you to just kind of explain this real quickly as far as just how educators can use this simple document um, to help our, to, to just kind of how this was used, uh, just to give us a little tutorial in less than a minute. So that map was created for students who may not be feeling like they are achieving the success that they expect, and it's meeting them where they're at, identifying and assessing where their challenges are right now, 
where we see some of the trends in their testing strategies, in their uh, preparation strategies, and then taking that approach on, okay, we see this, we know this about your learning methods or your learning preferences. Now, how do we put these two things together to at least have a framework to build from? And let's walk through this step by step. So I want you to do this before class. What part of that seems unrealistic or what part of this seems realistic? In class, these are some practical tips. I don't want to see your phone out anymore. You can be clear with that. I don't want to see your phone out anymore. There is no reason to have your computer out because you need to be using handwritten notes. Be very practical and very to the point if we mean to. Um, and then after class, I expect to see this. And sometimes that might mean I will have them come back in and show me what you did after class. I want to see it. And then after class, then I can coach them and say, okay, this is how we could make this one step better. So, you know, I've used different versions of this, Keith, um, and I keep adapting it over the course of time um, with new things that I'm seeing from my students, new challenges that I'm seeing, new resources that we offer at the college. And so this is something that I would encourage anybody to adapt to their institution. It is not the, you know, like it's not a one size fits all. And there's going to be processes in here that this is maybe not the flow of your thinking, or this isn't how it works best with your class, then adapt it, rearrange it, add to it what you need that um, applies to your classroom, and then see how that can be um, a practical something that they can walk away with, hard plan to at least give them a framework of what to do next. And then you can meet again to say, did we see success? What worked? What challenges were still there? How do we need to revise the plan? What are our next steps? And you know what I really like about uh, you know what you have here is that it's almost like a student assessment. It's like how we do a nursing assessment yes. for our patients. What this really is with these exam trends, looking at what is the assessment? What didn't you do well with studying? What about your test taking strategy? So I just, to me, it's almost like a, it's just a very, uh, it's just like a student assessment, Christy. Mm -hmm. And that's really, it's like, it's just taking the nursing process and it's like, sometimes you don't have to make uh, nursing education quite so hard, do we? Sometimes no, we- uh... this is, No, no, I did not like create anything new. Uh, so much of this is already out there. I am just bringing things together and mushing them together that, that makes sense for how I approach the classroom and the challenges that I've seen with my students. And, you know, we're all from different areas. We're all, especially with the pandemic, we've all had different lengths and been able to go back to in-class learning or stay remote. And so we're gonna have to adapt it to where we are right now and where we go in the future. Yeah. And, you know, Michelle says, can you share a copy of this? And Michelle, we already did. There is the link, it's already in the chat. You just go to that bundle, it's an S3 file and you can download a couple other uh, downloads in addition to that, uh, into that piece. And uh, Lisa said, just a quick question, kind of unrelated, what resources are available as a new, a new nurse, uh, nursing instructor? And I just wanna let you know, Lisa, if you go to my website, keithrn.com, I've got a student, an educator textbook called Teach Students to Think Like a Nurse. And uh, this is a resource that helps kind of educators who are new to enculturate them and kind of just to be able to just the thinking, the critical thinking, some basic student success. I don't go as deep as Christy did today, but that's a helpful resource uh, on Keith RN. And just in closing, I just want you to know that if you found uh, Christy's uh, feedback and her insights helpful tonight, I want you to know that she has shared them in incredible depth in her chapter with Mindy on uh, on academic success and thriving, not just surviving nursing education. In the volume one of uh, my Think Like a Nurse series for students, it's actually the third edition of the student textbook. Uh, it came out originally in 2013, then 2015, and now this is the third, a complete rewrite and a complete redone. So if you're familiar with that second edition, this is a complete redone, and Christy's contribution to that um, has been so appreciated and really strengthening the student success chapters. And then there's additional content in volume one on holistic care, on professional identity, and then um, in civility and how to really be create, create that civil environment as a nurse as a nurse in practice as well as as a student and encouraging that professional behavior and so if you'd like to learn more in that link 
there's an excerpt and you can sign up and I'll be having that for sale in April. It's still in the press. It's not published, but uh, I just want you to know it's available. So check out the information page to learn more and get on the, uh, the update list. And in closing, um, I just want to just kind of let you all know that Cindy Clark, uh, one of my heroes who has really done extensive work on civility and how we can create healthy cultures is going to be my guest in two weeks uh, from today. So I want you to join me then. But in closing, Christy, I want you to just kind of like, just what is your closing pearl or just your closing thought that you could leave us all with before you, uh, before we say goodnight? Just a closing thought, what would it be? I would say to ask yourself, why did you go into nursing? How can you apply that to your current students today? And to just remember that we can always do better. So what's not working now, we can always say, I've learned from it. I've grown from it. Does it mean that that's how we always have to do things? Yeah. You know, it's kind of like the Lowe's Home Improvement Store's motto is never <laughs> stop improving. Mm -hmm. And is that not true Absolutely. for every one of us as educators and, uh, and all that we do? There's always room for growth. We've never fully arrived. We can always just find those things that we can do to strengthen all that we do as educators. And again, to ultimately impact our students and the profession itself. So Christy, yeah. thank you again. It's been a blessing and uh, appreciate your insights. And I know our audience did too. We've got some great comments and appreciate all that you've done, Christy. So thank you again. Get back to your five children and uh, <laughs> bless you for all you do. We appreciate Reach out it. if you guys need anything. I'd oh, love yes, to be you know, Thank you for reminding me. You know, before we all leave, <laughs> yes, we have Christy has got an email address, as we all do, and she would love to hear from you. If you have questions, if things that, you know, that you just like to learn more or just want to understand if you're facing a specific challenge, uh, you know, she uh, would be glad to just... Uh, share what she can to help you out or to just answer your questions. And so, uh, you know, uh, feel free to reach out as needed. And with that, I'll see you in two weeks with Dr. Cindy Clark. And uh, you all be blessed in all that you do. And thank you for all that you're doing to be part of the needed change to strengthen and transform nursing education. Thanks so much.